ethnobotany is the study, in the simplest term, it's the study of plants and people. It's the way, it's the study of the way that people interact with plants, usually in traditional societies, but not necessarily. So all the things that people use plants for, ranging from medicine to construction materials to textiles to foods, you know, is all legitimate material uh, for ethnobotanists to study. Uh, and ethnopharmacology is a little more restricted because ethnopharmacology focuses on, I mean, the formal definition of ethnopharmacology is the, the interdisciplinary scientific study of biologically active substances used or observed by uh, indigenous people. So there are a few caveats. For one thing, it's not restricted to plants, right? A lot of what ethnopharmacology studies is, uh, might be things that come from animals. Uh, obviously, a lot of it has to do with the study of plant medicines or things used as medicines. But also, toxins are a good part of it. Uh, you know, the study of arrow poisons, for example, is certainly part of ethno pharmacology. So ethnopharmacology, as the name implies, the ethno part is about people and the pharmacology side is about pharmacology and the study of drugs. So it's interdisciplinary. It, it uh, focuses on all the ways in which people interact with drugs and toxins, you know, so it includes everything from pharmacology to chemistry to uh, anthropology to uh, you know, medicine, public health, you name it, toxicology, all of that. It relates to shamanism um, because in these indigenous or traditional cultures, usually the shaman is the person with the knowledge of the plants that are psychoactive, and or medicinal, uh, he's the person, he or she is the person that knows how to use these things. They're the keepers of the plant knowledge in a way. So that's, I mean, they're, they're more than herbalists, but uh, they're the, also the herbalists. They're the ones that know their medicines and how to use them for whatever purposes, spiritual and medical as well. In shamanism, um, and one of the things that distinguishes it from, from mere uh, herbalism, uh, is that the shaman is a specialist in altered states of consciousness. The famous anthropologist and scholar Mircea Eliade uh, calls shamanism the archaic techniques of ecstasy. And in shamanism, the shaman deliberately uh, is a master of various techniques for inducing altered states of consciousness, which may involve the use of psychoactive drugs, but not always. There are other techniques, too, that can be used, like frenzied drumming or dancing or flagellation or extremes of, you know, physical uh, stresses to induce altered states. But the idea is to deliberately induce an altered state and the shaman goes on a journey. Uh, this is the primary mode throughout the world that the shaman journeys to the center of the world, which may be visualized as a tree. It's often visualized as a tree or some kind of axis. But that axis unites the upper world, the middle world, our ordinary world, and the lower world. And the shaman <coughs> is a person who is able to navigate these realms uh, and, you know, knows how to, how to move around in these realms and actually retrieve information and come back. Or... A lot of what the shaman does is curing. It's related to curing. And, and in shamanic traditions, 
the understanding often is that uh, you know illness is caused by loss of soul and that the soul has wandered off and is out in these realms and the shaman has to go and find the soul and restore it to the person's body and then restore uh, you know, restore, cure the illness that way, whether the illness is physical or mental. And there's not really a distinction always made. You know, in fact, all illness in these traditions is usually understood to basically be due to witchcraft or, uh, you know, some sort of malevolent influence, even, even physical illness. So the shaman is a specialist. Uh, in this technique and they are often a specialist in the use of plants for, for inducing altered states of consciousness. That's the realm. So in some ways the shaman fulfills uh, a function for the society is in that he or she is the person with one foot in both worlds. He's a, a foot in the real world of everyday human affairs and the world of spirits and the supernatural. So they can be a conduit of communication between those worlds. And in some ways that's like a priest, you know. A priest represents the people to the realm of spirits and so on, but the shaman actually goes to these places and not just talks to these people, to these entities or whatever, but, but moves in these dimensions, which are very real experimentally for the, experientially for the shaman and for the people. And so curing is part of it, but also other things of concern to the community, where to look for game, for example, where to find when to plant the crops, all of this stuff comes from this realm of uh, sort of supernatural knowledge. So the shaman is a wise person, the keeper of knowledge and the, co and the connection to knowledge. So that's kind of a long-winded explanation. But the shaman has, you know, wears many hats in some ways. He, he, he or she fulfills multiple functions for the society. So these psychedelics and other types of what you might call psychoactive molecules are found widespread in plants and even animals and fungi and the whole thing. I mean, they're they're all over the place. So I think in I think in one sense that seems remarkable to us, but uh, in another sense we shouldn't really be surprised because this is a reflection uh, simply of biochemical evolution. I mean, we are evolved from the same ultimate origins that the plants are and the fungi are. So the fact that there are molecules in these organisms that mimic neurotransmitters and interact with neurotransmitter receptors and so on is just to be expected in a, in a sense in that, you know, uh, most of these uh, Psychoactive molecules are, you know, one or two steps from amino acids. Uh, the alkaloids generally come from amino acids, and especially uh, the example of DMT, where, uh, you know, tryptophan is an amino acid, and it's in all organisms because it goes into proteins. It's one of the amino acids that goes into proteins. But two enzymatic steps, two steps away from tryptophan is DMT. And the enzymes that do that conversion are pretty much found in any cell. So it's not too surprising in a way that DMT is very widespread because it's only two steps away from what they call primary metabolism. In other words, the metabolism that we share with everything.